And this is Rosie Casals. Came out of San Francisco years and years and years ago, it seems. I first saw her in 1964 when she was 15. She was the child wonder along with Peaches Bartkovich. We used to have bets as to who would win the 15 and under. Rosie's since when, since then done well. She's the spark plug of the tour. Everybody loves her. She uh, loves to give things away, she give the, the Lurex dress off her back to anybody who needed something. And she loves to spend money. She's just spent 15 months and $80,000 putting in an indoor swimming pool with murals on the, on the side. At her home in Sausalito? At her home. So here is Rosie serving at two games to three. There may be a confusion. Rosie is called Rosebud or Bud. So if we say Bud, it's for this match, it'll be Bud Collins. In her career as a world-class tennis champion, my guest in conversation today won 595 singles matches and 508 in doubles. She was five times a Wimbledon doubles champion with Billie Jean King and twice a mixed doubles champion at Wimbledon with Ilya Nastasi. She won four US Open doubles titles and one in mixed. And she was a member of the Fed Cup and Whiteman Cup teams seven times. Also, 50 years ago this year, she was one of the original nine. Nine female tennis players who defied their ruling bodies in tennis by creating their own individual tour. And this helped to make women's tennis the multi-million dollar um, global success that it is today. She is five feet, two and a quarter inches of pure tennis talent. She's Rosie Casals. Hi, Rosie. Hello, how are you doing? Really well, thank you. And thanks Good. so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. So Rosie, um, when we talk about 50 years ago, I mean, I bet you just can't believe that, can you? Just gone. Yeah, you know, when, when, when you're um, 50 years older, it, it sort of goes quickly. <laughs> you know, when you're younger, you're not really understanding what's in front of you, but uh, you certainly know what's behind you when you finally reach those magic years. Yeah, yeah. And how's 2020 been for you, this, this completely crazy year? Yeah, as crazy as it's been for everybody, um, I have a foundation, an ideal, uh, it's the Love and Love Tennis Foundation, I deal with kids. And so uh, because of the, you know, coronavirus, uh, we've had no kids, we've had no programming. And so that's starting to change little by little, but we're still in the pandemic and things aren't so good in, in the United States, as, as I'm sure you know. So uh, we have to take it one step at a time. But um, I've been playing a lot of tennis. I, I must say that that's one thing that uh, because I haven't been so busy, I decided, well, let's start hitting some more tennis balls. And it's kind of been my lifesaver. I have really enjoyed it. <laughs> Fantastic. And can I ask, how's the body after all that tennis? I mean, you never stopped. You were always there every, every year. I remember you know, switching on Wimbledon and you were always there, all the semifinals, you were, you were well, there right the way through. Yeah, right? well, you know, I, I wish I was 50 years younger, but actually, if I was in my 40s, I'd be a lot happier than being in my 70s, but my body's good. Yeah. Uh, I've lost some weight and that's always important and toning up and, uh, you know, uh, feeling, feeling pretty good for 72. Fantastic. Let's go right back. Uh, your... Your parents were from El Salvador, and but you were born in um, in San Francisco because that's Correct. where that's Correct. where they came to. Correct. Was it tennis for you right away? Were you were you good at it? Do you remember being introduced to it? Yeah, I was good at it right away. Actually, my dad used to play soccer, and uh, then he had a, a broken ankle, and he had to find another sport, uh, and so he started playing tennis. Um, and uh, going out to Golden Gate Park, a public park in San Francisco. And I kept on bugging him, take me, I'd like to play. You know, I'd see him every weekend, get his, you know, whites on and take the uh, wooden racket out of the frame. And I finally bugged him to death. He finally said, I'll take you. And I'd sit there watching. And then, you know, he'd send me to the uh, backboard and, and I'd start hitting. And 
boy, I mean, I was probably about eight, eight and a half. And I, I don't remember when I could not hit a ball. It came so easily. I mean, it was like sheer joy. This is exactly what I want to do. Wow. Pure natural talent, really. Yeah, I think I was, uh, you know, it, it was a good fit. And, and, and uh, you know, coming from kind of like the wrong side of the tracks, tennis really was a, an elite sport. It wasn't for everybody, you know, everybody wore their white tennis clothes and, you know, drove up in their Cadillacs and Packards and Buicks and stuff. And you know, so I realized when a little bit different from uh, from from what I'm used to, but uh you know, it, it was a blessing in disguise. So you could cope with that. You could cope with the fact that the kids that you were playing were probably from more wealthy backgrounds than you. You yeah. could you could cope with that right away. Well, we cope with it because I was so much better than they were. And and I realized, you know what? You may have your fancy clothes and, you know, look great, but you can't beat me. And that is one thing I had. And I think that's what made me uh, probably a little bit tougher, a little bit meaner, and uh, you know, it gave me that that uh, wet my appetite to be competitive. And I guess that not many kids that you were playing back then were playing your kind of game, that attacking game, that that's that serve and volley game, were they? Well, I mean, I'm sure other kids were playing that game elsewhere. And coming from California, obviously, we have very fast courts. So it was our style for California style. And uh, we played um, doubles all the time, mixed doubles, even in the juniors. So that was all a part of, you know, being able to serve, being able to volley, being able to play, have an all around game. So um, it, it, it fit me quite well. And when did you really start to break through? When was it evident that you could go right to the top? Well, I mean, I, I played throughout the juniors and I was ranked uh, pretty much in the top in my section of Northern California. And I started playing a lot of the senior tournaments uh, when I was about, you know, 13, 14, and I was doing very well and I'm winning some, getting the finals of others. And it really made me realize that uh, it, it, it is what I wanted to do and that I was good enough to, to start beating some of the women tennis players. Uh, so it it it, uh, it it made me want even more. And when you started to become good, and people talked about you and noticed you, even back then, were you were you given stuff like rackets? Were you given equipment, or did you have to buy all that at that stage? Well, in the beginning, obviously, um, you know, we had to buy the first racket for seventy for seven dollars uh, at Sears, and uh, it was a Wilson uh, with blue string. And I thought, wow, um, cat's meow with, I, I felt good, hit the ball over the net. And, and as I started to get a little bit better, Wilson came around and said, you know, we'd like for you to be a Wilson girl. We'll give you all the rackets, you know, you may need. Um, and so, you know, that was very helpful. Um, but it, again, it was an expensive game because once I started playing the t junior tournaments, you had to pay, you know, your entry fee. Um, you had to travel, put gas in the car. And, and when it ran, especially when it ran and I didn't have to push it, um, we, we, we were definitely going places. And do you remember the time when people said to you, listen, you can play Wimbledon, you can play the US Nationals, when did that start up? And are we talking kind of 63, 64, about then? Yeah, yeah, we, we are talking about that time. Um, I played, uh, I believe, Forest Hills when I was about 13 or 14. So I was already a junior and, you know, I'd gone back East to play some of the national tournaments in the junior and uh, was part of that um, uh, Forest Hills uh, open swing, you know, the. Uh, not open at that time, but uh, the amateur nationals. And uh, I remember getting to the maybe second round and losing to Norma Balon from Argentina and realizing that, um, uh, I, you know, I felt comfortable. Uh, we played on grass and of course being, as I said, a servant volleyer, that was uh, really up my alley. And, uh, you know, I think I realized that I, I really could compete on that level and it, got me very excited about 
wanting to leave the juniors um, and, and start playing more of the women tournaments. And your first Wimbledon, I think, was 1966. Is that right? Exactly. Uh, actually, I met Billie Jean in 19, I want to say 1963 or 64 at the Pacific Coast, which was the final tournament after all the circuit uh, in the summer. Uh, all the top players would come and play the Southwest, which was down uh, Kramer's tournament in L.A. And then they would come up to San Francisco and Berkeley Tennis Club to play the last tournament. And I played her in the, fi in, in the first round of a doubles. Uh, she was playing with Carol Codwell, uh, also from Southern Cal, and that's how I met him. And I remember seeing her, she had these uh, five rackets and the, uh, Fred Perry reef a skirt with a monogram uh, of her initials. And I thought, oh my God, this is what a real pro looks like. I mean, you know, both of them, uh, I have a great picture of that um, standing there uh, and, and we were to play them in the first round. We lost uh, six, four, seven, five. And I remember Billie Jean coming up to me and saying, you know, you're really a good player. And uh, I know I'm going to see you again. And I hope maybe there might be an opportunity where, where, you know, we might play together, but she was very complimentary. And, uh, you know, I stayed in my head and probably on the following year, I saw her again playing at, uh, our state tournament. And uh, I believe that's uh, the year that she and Karen Sussman won. And about a year later, she said, look, I'm looking for a partner because she wants to settle down with her husband, raise a family. And, you know, I need, I need a partner. So that was uh, 65 that she asked me, would I play with her in 66? And how can I say no? <laughs> and I mean, she was then a big star. She'd reached the women. Well, yeah, she won two Wimbledon. Yeah, two doubles Wimbledon. So I had a lot to um, live up to with uh, Karen Sussman, her partner. So um, I felt a little pressure. But did it work straight away, Rosie? the chemistry between you and Billie Jean? Yeah, yeah, the chemistry worked very well. I mean, you know, what she was, I was not, okay? She was experienced, I was not. Uh, she was disciplined, I was not. Um, we both had similar games, but hers was better. Um, mentally fit, she was strong. Uh, so I, I, I think I learned a lot from her in those um, former years. Uh, she was a good mentor. And uh, I, I think I was really fortunate, but, but, but as a young uh, a kid, you know, you, you think you can do it all by yourself. You don't need anybody. You don't tell me this, don't tell me that. So, you know, it's a little bit of both. You learn the hard way, you learn the right way. Um, but uh, we, we had good chemistry. I, you know, believed in her and she believed in me. And uh, on the court, um, well, uh, we, we certainly, um, I think we're very complementary styles. And uh, when I was down, she'd pull me up. When she was down, I'd pull her up. And then when we were together on it, watch out. So yeah. good team. Yeah, and you were just both so exciting to watch. I remember that, you know. I'm glad, I'm glad. Perfect to watch. But you know, it's it, it must have been tricky because there you are, you're, you became great friends. You, you're, you're playing together, you're winning together. But then as you started to, really got the singles rankings as well you're you're meeting her in in, in quarterfinals and and and, and semifinals and i know you had a few wins over her in your yeah, career okay. but she, not, but not you enough are, to be satisfying um <laughs> you know not enough but uh yeah she was always hard for me to play and it just seemed like she always raised her game to play better so she could make sure she showed who was the boss <laughs> and uh you know um, it was a tough uh, match for me to play um, and divorce myself from who I knew and, you know, her game. I'm, I, you know, we both knew our game very, very well. Unfortunately, she was on top of her game most of the times. And so, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a very, very tough uh, um, match to always play. You see, this is where I think um, performing, you know, show business, uh, has a lot in common with with being a professional athlete because you know we have we're we're friendly with other performers but sometimes you're going up for the same job the same part as as a good friend and you might not know that till you get to the audition then you find out they've got it you haven't got it or you've got it they haven't got it and you meet up and it's 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 
you're pleased for your friends, but also you want it, you want it for you. And I guess in, in, in tennis, it was the same thing. You, you were pleased when she won, but also you wanted to, to beat her, you know, that's. Of that's... course, of course, because that's the, the nature of the beast. I mean, you know, I'm very competitive. And uh, even though um, she was, you know, always ranked higher, um, I, I, I felt I should be able to beat her. I know her, you know, somehow she always found a way to get her game back, to get her mind back and focus and win. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's, uh, that's what winners do. And, and, and when you win a lot, you learn how to do that more. And, uh, even though I had my share of wins, um, I, I've got to say the mental, uh, fitness, was probably harder for me because when I grew up, a lot of it was talent and, and the discipline didn't come till later. And so um, you need a lot of things to go hand in hand. I mean, talent only gets you so far, right? Yeah. Then you need that mental, um, you know, toughness and, and, and discipline to get you to places that you're not going to get there if you don't have it. Yeah, that's what separates the the yeah. great performers, the great champions from from the rest. Absolutely, absolutely, and and you know we all know this when we compete. You know, uh, you know that there'll be some days that you don't have it. There'll be days that others, uh, you know, are going to play the best and you're not, and days that you may play your best and it's not good enough. You know, and yeah. you have yeah. to accept those things and. You know, I wish I would have won some grand slams in my singles. I, I came close. Um, you know, God, I played how many matches? 595? 595 singles matches. Wow. Where'd you get that bit of, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good one. It's all there, yeah. Rosie. Well, it's all there. <laughs> it's all there. Yeah, hard to find, though. But, uh, you know, uh, we had to play a lot of matches. Let's face it, during the times when we were, trying to organize the women and the, and the Virginia slums, uh, you know, there wasn't as much prize money as there is now. So you can be specialized now. You can be specialized and play doubles. You can be specialized, play mix or singles. Uh, then we have to play everything or else you weren't uh, going to afford your, your hotel or, or getting to the next place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you know, some players, I mean, Margaret Court, all time great champion. She's admitted that she actually froze a lot uh, at, at Wimbledon. Wimbledon particularly was not a happy hunting ground for her. She preferred in a way the US Open where it was, there was more noise, she didn't feel the pressure. She found that kind of silence of, of, of center court Wimbledon uh, really difficult to cope with. Um, were you the same on center court for instance or, or, or did you really enjoy that, I, that kind of pressure? I loved Wimbledon, especially center court. I think many players are like that where they have a favorite for some it's you know Nadal it's the French it's like coming home for Roger it's uh you know Wimbledon and and for Billie Jean it was always Wimbledon I mean I remember going with her in 1966 before they uh turn and started and she took me up to the stand she said you know this is like a holy cathedral l look at the court and she'd always do that and it was the greatest time because it was so silent and quiet. And in 24 hours, you're going to have all the seats filled and packed. And even though, uh, you know, the English were very polite, um, it was still very loud. You, you played for that moment. And, and uh, you know, for Margaret, uh, she had enough victories there to, to know that she could win. And... Uh, you know, she was a great competitor, great, great fighter. Um, 
but you know you have your special places that you prefer to play and and certainly Wimbledon has always been one of mine um and of course U.S. Open changed from Forest Hills to Flushing Meadows in 1978 so so much changed there but uh yeah. so I, I I never liked the French the Ritz stuff was not my favorite thing I had you know some success on on it, but uh, grass was was like the best. Yeah, it suited your game. So in 66, 67, before 68, because I know in 68 you turned pro for for that year, but in 66, 67, literally, how were you managing to live as a full-time tennis player? Well, I mean, I'm lucky that I was playing doubles with Billie Jean, so every time that she was invited somewhere, guess who came along? me <laughs> so okay. it, it made a lot and they gave you money under the table she might get 600 i might get 200 you know so um and life in the in in the mid 60s weren't as expensive as it is now now you can't go anywhere i mean you we would stay at the hotel lexham in london for you know uh five pounds a night so where where, where can you go now you'd be in a dump for sure but um <laughs> You know, so so it was uh, something that uh, lent itself to that time. And, you know, in our minds, we always felt that, hey, you know, we want to be pros. I mean, we start, you know, we remember Labors and Rose Walls and they couldn't play at Wimbledon. And they looked so good when you saw them play because I, as a kid, I they would come to um, certain arenas in, in the Bay Area, the Cow Palace, and we'd watch them play and maybe play, uh, you know, as a junior play an exhibition before. And that in my mind, you know, stood out that that the, he, here are the pros, but they were making hardly anything either, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, we, I mean, we played I mean, a lot of tennis. A couple of the couple players of the I've spoken to from that from that time, describe being asked to go to parties you know um sponsor parties and just be nice to everybody and almost almost prostituting yourself and i mean that in the you know in the best possible way so that you will get a ticket to the next tournament or maybe an airfare or maybe you'll stay with somebody or maybe you'll get a train fare or something you know it, it was it was kind of like that in in, in uh, those yeah, times well i mean you know you have to sell yourself and you have to um Probably, you know, I, I was more fortunate perhaps than others because I, I was tagging along with Billie Jean playing doubles with her. So, of course, if they want her, they would take me. So yeah. it was kind of a, a, a really um, good thing for me because I didn't come from any money. And so um, I was fortunate that uh, uh, Golden Gate Park and friends of Golden Gate Park helped me financially and gave me money. And so... Uh, it made it possible for me to travel and again, getting money un under the table. I, I mean, I thought I was rich when I had, uh, I think at the end of the year, I had $3,000 and I thought, oh my God, I mean, I'm, you know, and I put it in the bank, but uh, compared to, to now that, that, that's kind of, uh, that, what, what is that? 3,000 is your, um, uh, maybe four days of hotel or five days yeah. of hotel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. But in 1968, you did turn pro. You with, with Francoise Durr, and Jones, yeah. Billie Jean, a couple of the guys, uh, yes. for a guy called George McCall. What was what was that year in 68 as a pro like? Well, the National Tennis League, um, you know, we got contracted and paid, I think I was paid about 25,000 plus bonuses if you won X amount, whatever. I think I made about 45,000, almost eh, thereabouts. And th for us, it was real money. Yeah. But after coming from playing in the country clubs and, you know, playing with the men and women, and all of a sudden we are playing on our own. There's only four women, Ann Jones, Frankie, myself, and Billie Jean, in addition to Labor, Rosewell, Jimeno, and uh, a couple other players. And basically, we played at the south of France, uh, started in April, it was freezing, I remember it rained, and we played in the worst places, you know. I mean, small arenas, maybe 300 people, um, some of the courts were just laid down, you could see the asphalt, and, and, and then the court would end on the baseline, you'd have to sort of jump up a little bit and watch you just stub your toe, 
The lights were horrible. We traveled by car, we traveled by train, we traveled by, you know, and we were playing almost every night. So um, I thought, God, I think we, God, did we make a mistake or what? I mean, we were used to the country club, you know, being wined and dined and taken care of. And all of a sudden we're hoofing all over the place um, and, 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 and trying to uh, look and see who's watching us, you know, how, how is this existing? And, and, and this is when labor was great and Roswell was great and Gonzalez and all, but we learned so much. We learned how to be independent, um, you know, how to get along with people, um, how, how to promote ourselves. You know, it, it, it was really an eye opener because, you know, I, I was young and, uh, um, you know, it was something that I didn't expect, but I was in awe of, 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 of the pros and labor and, 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 and the fact that they would play with us, they would hit with us. So, I mean, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. I, th I mean, that was worth a lot. They were, they were great. I loved them. And it must have improved your game as well. But I, I guess you were so used to playing each other, you and Billie Jean and, and Frankie Dern and Ann Jones, that what was it like when you then faced somebody else, a different style of tennis? Uh, well, you know, that, 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 was a, that, that was a trick. Um, you know, even though we had played against them before, but there were also some new players. But, uh, you know, I, I think you assess the situation very quickly and figure out, well, okay, I know what I'm looking for here. And I mean, you're used to doing that, even if you're playing uh, different people, but it's so, it's always nicer when you know them and you know what to do. So, so. 1969 comes and there you are, you're a pro. Great, you're getting some money, but um, the ratio between men and women was really crazy. And I know that none of the women were saying, listen, we're as good as the guys. We want equal prize money at that point. But what you wanted was the ratio to be much more yeah, a fair closer, because it was a little bit more uh, fair and yeah. and it was yeah. not it was definitely and 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 the fact that you you would have the Billie Jean Kings and the Virginia Wades and the you know Margaret Courts and uh, uh, other uh, Ann Jones uh, and and they're playing at the top and and they're you know uh, playing well enough to be paid well enough and making the tournament and uh, and on the other hand. You know, you're you're not always having the best players, the best male players in the tournament. So uh, that was a little unfair. You get the number one in the world uh, woman, whether it was Billie Jean that at that time or, or or Margaret Court, and then you know you would get a Dennis Ralston or or a Stance, somebody who was not number one, and they're they're getting more money because they're guys, and yeah. and 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 better scheduling because they're guys, and better everything because they're guys, and so. It really came to a head um, probably in 1970, you know, for sure in 1970, um, you know, started in the summer and, you know, we, we were very unhappy about the ratio of prize money and how we were being treated. And because we had a circuit that was with the men. Yeah. And yeah. so we had to go according to, and most of the promoters were men. Yeah. So you decided to take a massive risk, and it really was a massive risk. I mean, the famous photograph that we see of the original nine sitting there smiling with your one dollar contracts, etc. What people don't realize is that just before that, phone calls had been made, and quite a few of the players had been threatened. You'd been told you will if if you do this, if you go ahead with this individual tournament, you 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 may not play Wimbledon, you may not play Australia, you may not play for for your country anymore you took a massive risk rosie i uh, we we certainly did and and um when i think back at that time um you know i was young uh there were those were a little older more um you, you know uh experienced but everybody felt the same everybody individually felt the same and collectively felt the same and to think that nine women went out and agreed on something that was so important that was going to change the face of women's tennis, um, the future, and, and uh, made that decision that we didn't care if we were suspended. Um, we were going to do the right thing. And this was the right thing. And, of 
course, 50 years later, it's yeah, proven yeah. to be the right thing, incredibly so. And, and you won uh, that tournament. But, you won that first tournament. With yeah, no, I, I was thrilled to death to, to have been <laughs> able to say that I was the first one to win uh, a Virginia Slims of Houston. But um, it, it, it took a lot. I mean, it, it, it did not only just take those nine women. It, it, it took a Gladys Hellman. It took a Joe Coleman from, uh, from Philip Morris. Um, you know, it took a Billie Jean King to lead. So, um, you know, Julie Hellman calls it the trilogy and, uh, you know, rightly so, because those three components came together. And um, if it wasn't for the nine and the three and all of us uh, feeling that that we needed to do something and make a statement uh, that for women and, and an impact that women not 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 only in the sports uh, 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 arena, but in business, uh, I think people started to look at the women as leaders and um, you know uh, I, I wouldn't trade that part of history because it was so important that it paved the way uh, for women's tennis and women's sports and sports in general uh, on how they saw women. Yeah, yeah. Was it a success straight away? I mean, that, that first tournament, do you remember people turning up, people coming along, getting lots of good publicity? Yes, because uh, I think they understood what we were trying to accomplish, okay? Uh, I think they understood that we were breaking away from the old establishment and that we were trying to um, start something different. Uh, we all felt that, that we wanted to pursue careers and um, in sports and, and, and not everybody you know, felt that we should. I mean, they felt, you know, you're a woman, you get married, you have kids, you take care of your husband and you stay home. Even though Margaret Court did not. <laughs> <laughs> she traveled with her husband and her babies and her nannies and what have you and you know did very well yeah but, i mean uh, in a way she was she was women's lib in action she really was yeah, well even though she didn't agree on it i mean you know she didn't come and step forward like you know people say well i would have played or i i could have played i could have you know but they didn't these nine women did you know carrie and judy and and, and Julie and, 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 you know, Christy Pigeon and Peaches Berkowitz, um, they all stepped forward and took that chance. And, and even though the other ones uh, said they were on board, we had trouble finding players to play, women yeah. to play. Yeah. 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 People are scared though. You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit like, again, bringing it back to, to, to what I do, you know, we have a union, we have equity and a lot of, a lot of actors sometimes won't, um, they won't step up. You know, they won't call equity if there's a problem because they don't want to be a troublemaker. They don't want to be seen as a rebel. So I guess that's what you were finding. You nine were willing to take the risk and there always are people who will do it, but there's a whole load of other people who kind of ride on your, on your coattails, really. They come and, in when you and, open and, the door. And understood, you know, because um, you don't want to be someone who rocks the boat but we were all, you know, probably because of, of how we felt and we were unhappy about things and, 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 and playing with the men and not getting our share of the prize money. I think we felt, look, if we don't say anything and, you know, tell Jack Kramer, change that, uh, what ca can you do to help? And he says, I don't care about the women. And pretty much everybody felt that way. And so when Gladys came along and we talked to her, she said, well, let me see if I can put something together at my club. And yes, we had spectators. And yes, we ended up with prize money, thanks to Philip Morris and, and the women uh, of, of the volunteers uh, uh, society that helped raise the money, asked their husbands, you know, for money. And, and, and we, we ended up, uh, I think I, I made probably about $250 more than Stan Smith uh, did winning the singles at Pacific Southwest. So I'm happy that 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 was, you know, definitely in the books. And and so, yeah, and, and when I look back, and as I'm sure everybody, when they look back to the history of women's tennis, oh my gosh, you know, we created that monster. 
and subsequently from that Title IX and, 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 and in 72, and then, you know, starting the Women's Tennis Association in 73. Wow. You yeah, know, we it. made inroads. Did it upset you, Rosie, at, at, at the time that a lot of the guys just weren't on your side? They just they just didn't want to know. You didn't get supported by by people like Arthur Ashe and, and no, certainly uh, Dennis Ra Arthur Ashe, Charlie Passer, all those guys. Uh, they weren't supportive. Uh, Fred Stolle, um, you know, uh, M. O. Roy Emerson. He he was a little bit more supportive than most guys. Um, but yeah, of course, you know, you look back and you say, well, why, why were you so against us? Because they felt we were taking money out of their pocket and women aren't supposed to do that. You're supposed to be happy when they reach into their pocket and give you a couple of bucks and say, I gave you this. I allowed you to have your allowance, let's say. So, of course, you, you have very strong personalities like Billie Jean or myself, you know, um, fighting and t saying, look, we're, we're not happy with that. That's not good enough. Okay, you may feel as you guys do, but we feel otherwise. And our tennis is about um, uh, 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 entertainment. Um, we're not talking about, can we hit as hard as you? Do we have to play three out of five? Um, you know, does that mean that we should get the same money because we're playing you know, three out of five and not two out of three. And well, this argument, as you well know, has gone on. It's just like saying, uh, you know, Elton John's going to put on a show for 45 minutes and then you have the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the opener band that, that wants to play for an hour and a half. Who cares? No, they want to see 45 minutes of, of, you know, Elton John. Yeah. So, so quality, it, not it, quantity, basically. There we have it. That's uh, well said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you came up against the players who didn't join you, first of all, players like Margaret Court, Virginia Wade, etc., did this make you more determined to try and beat them? Oh, absolutely. Of course, <laughs> we wanted to make sure we ended up with the money and not them. And unfortunately, also, they went against us by supporting the USTA um, uh, Women's Tour that ran against ours. So instead of us having them join us on the Virginia slums and being stronger and better, they went the other way. So yeah, I, I didn't think highly of that. I, I mean, the women should have stuck together. We probably would even get gotten to where we got a lot faster, but because they were probably, I would say pretty selfish, they can win, they can earn more money because they were dominating. And so I don't blame Yvonne or Chris because they were young. Yeah. yeah. You know, they were young. Uh, yeah. They were told to do that. So go play the USTA. Chris has always been a USTA person. I understand that. But yeah. those yeah. other two, no, I don't, you know. Yeah, because but, they were older. You know, yeah. Bygones are bygones. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't hold grudges like that. But certainly, um, there was friction. Yeah. So how is it now, Rosie, when you when you all meet up? I mean, obviously, with the other girls who were the original nine, you're all you all remember those days and you were you were solid. But what's it like when you come across the players who didn't join you or do you just avoid the subject? You just you just smile. Well, and... I mean, of course, uh, I haven't seen anybody uh, other than uh, Valerie Sigenfuss, uh, uh because of the pandemic. And of course, we did not get an opportunity to celebrate in person. We did celebrate through a virtual um, a very beautiful salute to the original nine. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I, when, when we touch base, uh, we're not, you know, I'm not going to uh, rub it in their faces that, that, that uh, and especially uh, the 50th celebration, had I seen them, then, then I'm, I may have said you could have been a part of this, you know, but, but I have not seen Margaret. I've not seen Virginia. And uh, I have seen Billie Jean because I stayed with her during the U.S. Open. And, uh, and uh, uh, of course, I mean, we all feel the same way. Um, why did they did what they did? Because at first they were supporting, they, they wanted to support us. They said they wanted to support us. And, uh, and then they left. Regina went to England and 
Margaret said, uh, I can't, I can't play. I'm injured. I'm going to back home to Australia. Yeah. Well, but it was show business, Rosie. And some of the some of the clothes you wore, thanks to the brilliant tennis designer, Teddy Tindling. Yeah. Your creations were just fabulous. I mean, everybody's talked about them. I'm sure playing in silver, lame, sequins, suede, <laughs> under lights, because a lot of those tournaments were in uh, yeah. How did you yeah. cope with that? Well, I mean, you know, he, 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 Ted Tingling, as you said, uh, an incredible human being, you know, uh, very sassy, very, very uh, creative, let's say. And, and, he, and he fit everybody to their personality. And he felt that I was about, you know, being very flashy and entertaining. And because we played uh, so much in the evening, uh, the Virginia Slims, so he said, we need to have something flashy, something sequins, something, you know, rhinestones. And boy, some of these outfits weighed about 10 pounds, if not more, 15 pounds. But uh, I loved them. Um, they were me. And I think the people enjoyed it. Um, so uh, when we talk about fashion, especially now, I see the players wearing the same outfit day in and day out, Monday through Sunday. And not only them, but everybody else. And I thought, Gosh, with all this money out there, why can't you have a, a different outfit every single day, right? Yeah, At least yeah. that's how I feel. But now, you know, everybody thinks differently. Life is different now. But I thought that during our time, it, it, half of the fun was seeing what Ted was going to make. Well, it was it was so individual. I mean, what's what's crazy now is that sometimes you'll get two players playing against each other and they're both in the identical yeah. outfits yeah. that when i see that i think that's that's totally crazy that's yeah crazy. no i i don't think it should be allowed to tell you the truth seriously yeah. Yeah. Uh, because there's so much individualism and personality wise and stuff and i do know that nadal gets to wear his thing and roger at the time when he was working nike gets to wear his thing and and maria sharapova had her thing and nobody else had it and that's the way it should be yeah because yeah. you should yeah. be unique yeah, and you, you look are. forward to what they're going to wear. Yeah, you know, when they, absolutely. But yeah. when I know that the same clothing is going to be put, I mean, you know, black is black, red is red, and, you know, we're going to look at the same thing day in and day out, you know, for hours on end. And, and then, uh, like you said, who's who? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. they all had their dresses. Margaret Court with the big collars and Billie Jean. Yeah. With the no, no, no. Look, we were entertainers, so that's why we were in your field, you know, yeah. Yeah. trying to understand the mentality. We dressed for them. We played for them. Um, our events were um, entertaining events. There was always something that's, you know, the, the, the entrance, you know, the, 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 the spotlight, the, the introductions, uh, you know, they were entertaining and they were showbiz. showbiz. We were showbiz. Yeah. Yeah. When you retired, Rosie, were you, were you okay with that? Some, some players when the tennis stops? They just can't cope for a while. It takes a few years of adjustment. How, how were you when you decided to stop playing? Well, I mean, you know, of course, uh, no one ever wants to stop playing, um, but age gets to you and younger players come up that are hungrier. And, uh, but I, I started a company called Sports Women and I ran for five years um, the Women's Tennis Classics. And then I merged them with the men. So we had Nastasi and some of the, older, you know, Billie Jean and Virginia and Yvonne and Carrie, and we played, um, you know, uh, uh, in, in certain arenas and, 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 you know, did the entertaining, did the clinics, did the social. And, and I felt we were giving something back, you know, there were places that where they'd never had tennis before. And to see somebody like Billie Jean and Virginia and myself and Yvonne, and um, Martina was still too young, so she was still playing. But it was it was fun to do that, and uh, so we stayed in tennis a little bit and enjoyed that part of it. And uh, as you go through life, of course, you always have to find things to um, to do. I, I don't think anything will ever take the place of you know playing tennis, you know, the way one played, and and uh, uh, to enjoy and competing, that competing. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 a whole different ball game. It's a whole different uh, mindset. But yeah. we all know that we can't do it forever, and we have to find things that will 
um, you know, bring us happiness and pleasure and what whatever else you need to have. And do any of the uh, the younger players come up to you when you when you go to the tournaments and say thank you, or do they want to know about those days? No, not enough. Uh, certainly this year, because it's been on the forefront of uh, Tennis Channel and everything else. But no, I mean, we unfortunately, uh, what what I'd like to see is 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 I'd like to meet an Osaka. I, I'd like to meet, um, you know. Uh, uh, Bianca. I'd like to meet these younger players. I mean, they don't know us. I don't know them. Um, and 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 I, I I'd like WTA to do a better job of bringing, um, you know, the past, present, and the future together, uh, so that we yeah. could talk and meet and you know get to know one another. And 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 yeah. and they should know more of the history, because um, you know where they are in life and what. I mean, Osaka making three million in two weeks, seven matches. That's pretty good. How? I mean, you know, Billie Jean made a hundred thousand by playing fifteen tournaments or something like that, or twenty twenty two weeks. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Uh, yeah. So it would be great, with... wouldn't it, to get I don't know to sort of get a big arena or something because now there's so much footage that you can see thanks to YouTube. Uh, Etc. You could. It'd be great to get some of the younger players and just say, "Okay, sit here, look at this big screen, and let's just play a little bit of the seventies. You playing Billie Jean, and, and just to just for them to realize that you've been out there as well. You know what it's like. Yes, it was different, but you I, were you were doing what they do now. You know. I agree, but I think things have changed so much that it's so hard for WTA to get directly to a player. There's always the agent, the manager, the you coach, you know, it's crazy that you cannot have interaction with your own association. And I wish they would uh, improve that because uh, it is the Players Association. It's worked well for them for many, many years. Um, thanks to those that uh, decided that they should unite and have one voice. And that's, that was WTA, Women's Tennis Association. So, yeah, I mean, I'd like to see a lot of different things and changes and, and, you know, bring us together and, and, you know, have entree to those players, but, you know, they don't, they don't make our, our old life uh, easy. I mean, it's har harder to get into Wimbledon. You can't go here. You can't go there. You can't go in the locker. You got to stay in the final eight. You can't. So, you know, you never really go anywhere where they go. You can't eat where they eat. You have to eat where you should eat. And granted that you want to see your, you know, your, your group of players, but, but I think anybody that's played Bumble and done what we've done, they should give us access to anywhere we want to damn well go to. Yeah, I agree totally. Do you think they're having fun these days, Rosie, these players? Well, I don't think they had as much fun as we did because we were friends. I mean, we're close. We did everything together because we had to. You know, we had to warm one another up, even if we were playing one another up. We had dinner together we had breakfast together we traveled together we stayed at one another's homes or friends or families and we still you know pretty much we we talked to one another not not as much because but but we still stay connected and we will always remain friends because we have a bond we have something in common and we we know what what that meant and what it means to us still Rosie, I could go on talking to you all night because I'm a tennis geek completely. Oh, no, good. You can probably well, gather. We always this. like them. <laughs> we could That's go great. Further. But it's just been well, terrific. And, uh, you know, once again, on behalf of Acting for Others, a big, big thank you. And thank you. But listen, everybody, if you've, if, if you've, if you've enjoyed watching this, uh, please go back to the Acting for Others uh, website and you can hit the donate button. That will take you straight to a very safe, secure, just giving page and you can give whatever you can to help performers and people working behind the scenes, all the, all the creatives, as well as the artists who are having a bit of a tough time at the moment. And generally, some of them have a bad time anyway. Rosemary, Rosie Casals, Rosebud, as everybody used to call you, it's been terrific. Thanks for giving up your time. Thank you, Mark. Have okay. a great evening. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.